All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry about this. I guess I, I, ex I explained in the email uh, that I couldn't come in today because I, you know, just found out this morning that I got uh, was exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID yesterday. So, uh, I mean, we were masked and everything, and I'm fully vaccinated, and so. Hopefully everything is fine, but it just seemed like uh, it would be a better idea not to come in. Um, so, well, end the quarter on this virtual note. Um, uh, and so I guess, well, well, let me get the chat if you're here. Um, uh, for the two of you who are here right now, do you have questions about the final assignment or anything like that before I start talking about Nietzsche? Oh, three of you who are here, do you have questions? All right, well, I mean, if you think of a question later, you can ask me. All right, so I'm just gonna start talking about Nietzsche. I'm also, I feel like, and this is also not ideal for the last lecture of the quarter. I, I have to tell you, I feel a little scattered. Today was pretty chaotic, <laughs> but uh, oops, and now I'm frozen. For God's sakes. Now. Okay. This camera. All right. Now I'm using the built-in camera. Not as good, but there it is. Um okay. Um I need to kill the USB. Anyway, all right. So uh, I'm going to start by going back to the beginning of part two of Zarathustra. So um, at the beginning, the um, the happy bestowing teaching, right? Like he was, he was very happy at the beginning of part two. He's very unhappy at the end of part two. Um, and then, I mean, you could draw another graph here, kind of like I drew only um, uh, not of height, but of like happiness as, as Zarathustra as the book goes on, right? So, but, you know, at the beginning of part two, he's happy, and then as he goes down, and then he becomes unhappy down there, and then he goes back up, and he becomes happy, but then when he's up there, he becomes unhappy again, and then at the end of part three, he again becomes happy, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, so that the happy bestowing teaching at the beginning of part two, was that um, the will to power liberates, meaning that the will uh, makes itself free by um, by willing to enforce my own private risky command against myself, and hence ultimately to destroy myself. But that's good because. Uh, Freedom or power is worth more than life. Um, so that makes me happy <laughs> that uh, that I can will that I can will to enforce my own private law against myself, even though um, like ultimately I won't be able to obey it, and uh, and therefore that enforcement will consist in. Um, creating my successor. Um, uh, 
Right. So as uh, in, in part two, one of the things that Zaratus just says is the liberating will is the will to create out of myself. And I think that means, again, it's specifically the will to, it's the will to procreate, that is to produce my children. Um, as Zaratustra keeps saying, but the, the children here are the creatures who will be able to overcome me and kind of like make amends or atone for me, as he sometimes describes it, by destroying me. So um, at the beginning of part three, the question arises whether Zarathustra doesn't kind of regret having bestowed this teaching. Um, or at least, um, Um, not regret, and at least he thinks of it in some kind of negative way, right? Because he imagines his solitude saying to him, and this is in the section called the homecoming. Um, so, you know, the, I guess so. Actually, most of the beginning of part three is is Zarathustra going back to his cave, and he passes through the continents. Right. Well, I mean, first he he hikes over the the ridge of the blissful island, and he goes down to the other coast, and he gets on a ship, and he crosses the ocean, and he then has to cross the continent on the way to back to his cave. And he ends up back in the um, um, in that town that he used to live in, the Pied Cow, um, right before. Doesn't mention that he's, he's in that town again. Um, oh yeah, right. So that's the end of the the section called the apostates of the apostates. It says that Zarathustra was back in the town which he loved, and which he called the Pied Cow. And from there, he has only two days to go to arrive back at his cave. So, I mean, um, there's probably, there's, there definitely has to be some reason why that whole journey is described and why it has those stages. Um, and why he has to say the things he says there now, like about the great city. Right on the way before, so the Pied Cow is not a great city, it's just a town. Um, on his way back, though, he passes the great city, and there's Zarathustra's ape for the fool who warns him away from the great city. Um, and then in response, he talks about the virtue of passing by or, um, um, uh, so, um, right, and before that, when he's on the ocean, he's talking to the sailors, um, and he's, you know, he says, this is the right thing to address to you, oh, you adventurous ones. Um, uh, so, I mean, there's definitely got to be a reason for all of that and why it's there and not, for example, like, why didn't he pass the great city in part one? <laughs> Um, why do, why is this the place where we have to, to get that particular conversation? Um, 
However, um, I'm saying there has to be a reason, obviously, because I don't know what the reason is, so I'm not going to tell you the reason. Um, but, uh, but so therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping to this chapter called the homecoming, which is when he finally gets back to his cave. And uh, he imagines his solitude talking to him. He imagines his solitude scolding him, right? He says, now shake your finger at me as mothers do. Now smile at me as mothers smile. And now say, and then his solitude, you know, gives this whole speech, which is, I mean, it's interesting. I just thought of this now. All the other women that he imagines are all like um, romantic relationships. Uh, maybe that's not the right word for it, but in any case, they're um, they're like women who he's thinking of marrying or who are jealous of each other because he's paying more attention to one than the other and so forth. Whereas his solitude, he imagines as his mother. I don't know what to do with that other than to point it out. But anyway, so this is among the things that his solitude says to him is, do you remember, O Zarathustra, when you sat upon your island, a well of wine among empty buckets, giving and distributing, bestowing and outpouring among the thirsty, until at last you sat alone, thirsty among the intoxicated and lamented each night. Is it not more blessed to receive than to give and more blessed to steal to, than to receive? That was loneliness. Loneliness is here the, um, is in contrast with, with solitude. Right, so such solitude. She's saying to him, you know, you can you you thought you should go down to the mountain to speak because you confused solitude with loneliness, and um, so uh, you thought you had to leave your solitude so you would no longer be lonely, so you could speak and pour out your wisdom. But um, but in fact, uh, you know, loneliness is um, is the condition you reach down there when you realize that you were pouring everything out, but that um, Well, but what? I mean, it's not exactly that no one was receiving. They were empty buckets to begin with. They weren't co-creators. Again, I keep emphasizing that, that the co-creators that he said he was looking for in part one, he never finds. But so they were disciples. They didn't have anything to give. All they could do is receive. Um, and at the end, um, you sat alone, thirsty among the intoxicated. So, um, so it's not that they couldn't receive, but they couldn't receive as co-creators or friends. They couldn't receive in a way that would make you stronger rather than weaker. Um, so, um, So the will to speak to them was not the will to power, I guess you might say. I'm not too satisfied with that. I mean, before he did describe the, you know, the very first thing he said was that, um, He had to pour out his wisdom in order to go down, to go under, to perish. Um, so, but, 
but I guess so the, 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 but the point is that's not how it, it didn't work the right way. Um, anyway, what he says in response to this imagined speech from solitude, one of the things he says is, down there, however, all speech is in vain. There, the best wisdom is to forget and pass by. I have learned that now. He who wants to understand all things among men has to touch all things, but my hands are too clean for that. Um, so, I mean, somehow he's learned that the kind of going down he was doing was not the right kind of going down. Or maybe that he's learned that the down up distinction, the way he understood it, was not right. Um, and that, so anyway, that's why I say at this point he seems to regret having made that speech, that, that having given that speech. Now, on the other hand, um, The thing that he never said down there was uh, the eternal recurrence, as I mentioned at the end last time. Exactly what is happening now has happened before and will happen again, over and over, forever. So it's not only that he didn't say that down there, it's that he kind of said the opposite of that. And moreover, when he said the opposite to that, that was the exact point where there was some problem between him and the disciple. Right? Because he, what he said was, this is way back again on page 111, all that is intransitory, that is but an image, and the poets lie too much. And I mean, at this point, we think, uh, and there's a helpful footnote in, in uh, Hollingdale where he like quotes the end of Goethe's Faust to show that um, Nietzsche is kind of, well, he says parodying it in this chapter. I'm not sure if parodying is the right word for it, what he's doing. Um, but anyway, he's somehow responding to it. Right, and that thing about all that is intransitory, that is but an image, is like an inversion of something that Goethe said. Yeah, the final mystic chorus. This is, and this looks like it should be footnote 19, but it's or 14, but it's actually footnote 19 back here. In, page 340, the final mystic chorus of Goethe's Faust part two is burlesqued in this chapter. Verbal references to it, to it will be clear from the following literal translation. All that is transitory is but an image. That's how it starts. So, um, right, so, so at that point, when he says the poets lie too much, he, he, he seems to be talking about Goethe, right? Goethe said, all that is transitory is but an image. And Zarathustra says, the intransitory is only an image and the poets lie too much. But then, so, I mean, so far that's, I mean, forgetting for the moment about the eternal recurrence, that's fairly straightforward. But then on page 149, and I read this part last time too, um, he's uh, lecturing to one of his disciples and he's saying, you know, the spirit has been only figuratively spirit to me and all that is intransitory in quotes, that too has been only an image. 
And the disciple says, I heard you say that once before, and then you added, but poets lie too much. Why did you say that poets lie too much? So at that point, he has a, um, he says a bunch of things about why he, he can't be asked why he says things. But then he says, yet what did Zarathustra once say to you? But the poets lie too much? But Zarathustra too is a poet. Do you now believe that he spoke the truth? Why do you believe it? The disciple answered, I believe in Zarathustra. But Zarathustra, so he rejects that answer. But then he says, but granted that someone has said in all serious that the poets lie too much, he is right. We do lie too much, right? So at this point, he's not talking to, about Goethe, he's talking about himself, right? Because like, as you pointed out, I mean, that is, Zarathustra is talking about himself. It's not clear whether Nietzsche is talking about himself, but Zarathustra is talking about himself, right? Because he's saying that, um, um, uh, Zarathustra too is a poet. Why do you think I'm telling the truth? And then he adds, but by the way, uh, it's true. We poets do lie too much. <laughs> yeah, so why am I going to so much uh, detail in this? Because it suggests at least, I can think of two different ways of taking it. One way of taking it would be to think that, um, when he says the intransitory is only an image, he's lying. Um, and I guess it's pretty clear in what sense you might think he's lying because the, if we take the eternal recurrence seriously, then everything is the intransitory, right? Everything eternally recurs. Um, so it's, I mean, it's really good to have who was telling the truth. The transitory is only an image. You think things pass away never to come back, but we're wrong. They're coming back. <laughs> um, uh, so I mean, if so, if there is eternal recurrence, then that's at very least misleading. If, but I think you know, you could think of it as a complete lie. And um, why is he lying to his disciples? For that? Well, he just said that you can't ask why he's doing things, but uh, he said that to the disciple. Um, uh, so, um, Nietzsche didn't say that to us. Zarathustra said that to the disciple. Anyway, even if Nietzsche did say that to us, uh, what right does he have to tell us? <laughs> of course, we're going to ask him why. So, why did Zarathustra lie? And um, I guess it's because this is what he sometimes calls a pitying lie, right? He took pity on his disciples because they don't have sufficient spirit to, uh, to receive the truth. So he can't tell them the eternal reference. So instead he tells them that uh, the intransitory is only an image. Um, you know, there's infinite progress ahead of us, basically. That's the impression he seems to leave his disciples with. I mean, he does say that thing at the end about how the will has to learn to will the past, but he doesn't explain how that's gonna be possible to the disciples. So at least, um, that's 
one way of taking what's happening in that conversation with the disciple. Um, as I said, there's two ways I can think of taking it. The other way would be to take it to mean that the eternal recurrence is only an image. He told us that the, uh, the transitory is only an image. Um, I feel like there's a viable reading in that direction too, but I'm not sure how to take it farther. Um, but I mean, it's certainly like, um, and I'm gonna say more about this in a moment. There's, there's certainly a question about whether and why we really believe in the eternal occurrence. Um, I mean, you know, that would mean, the weird thing about that though would mean that he's telling the truth to his disciples and he's lying to himself. I'm not sure, like I said, how to go any farther with that. So let me just assume that the first reading is right. So, so in other words, so uh, like that, I think helps to explain maybe what's going on in that dialogue with silence, with solitude, if we go back to it. Like what went wrong, people were there to receive what he had to give. Um, um, so, like when he says in response to solitude, um, down there, all speech is vain. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that he told them the whole truth, but that he didn't understand it or something like that. Um, it has to mean that um, I guess you could put it this way, that, that, that the joyous impulse to bestow his wisdom was, uh, had to miscarry because that, right, that joyous impulse came out of love for his disciples. But love for his disciples was exactly what prevented him from ultimately bestowing his wisdom on them. He couldn't bear to, um, there was something he could have told them that wouldn't be in vain, but he couldn't bear to, to tell them. Um, this, I guess, is somehow related to Oh, wait, someone just asked, oh, that was a while ago. Oh, sorry, what were the questions about? Oh, oh no, okay, I remember. It was just when, when I first started before you came in, oh, and I was, I was asking if there were any questions about the final assignments or anything like that. Okay, uh, I think that's what you're responding to. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, All right. yeah, so anyway, um, So now um, in part three, and you know, is he planning to go back down again? So at some point he does say, I'm gonna go back down for the last time before the great noontide. Um, but in fact, he doesn't go down at the end of part three. Um, and remember that although Nietzsche did end up writing part four, uh, 
wait, does I haven't read part four again this year, so I'm having trouble remembering. Does he ever go down in part four? Whether he does or not, he ends up back on the mountain at the end of part four, too. So, um, um, so he doesn't do what he says at some point he's going to do. He says, you know, I'll go down for the last time and the last gift I'll give them is my death and whatever. He doesn't do that. Instead, part three ends with him uh, uh, conducting this kind of marriage ceremony with eternity. <laughs> um, so, um, um, so it seems like he's learned that this bestowing virtue is, um, not worthwhile, or at least not the way he thought it was. Um, in any case, what he imagines solitude saying to him is, you know, now you have learned silence. Um, right, so now he's learned to keep silent. But that doesn't mean that he stops talking. <laughs> That's, that's, that's the weird thing about it. On the contrary, it means that he only talks up here when no one's listening. <laughs> so, um, so once he's back up on the mountain, and, and that's, you know, the continuation of the same thing, um, or actually it comes before the thing that I was reading before. Here, the words and word chests of all existence spring open to me. All existence here wants to become words. All becoming here wants to learn speech from me. So he, he keeps talking when he's up there at first. He keeps talking, and he even uh, remains a teacher. At least his animals call him a teacher. But who is he teaching? So... Um, Well, he's teaching, one way thing you could say is he's teaching no one and everyone. He's teaching no one because no one's there to hear him, but he's teaching everyone because all you have to do is buy this book to hear him. <laughs> um, that is the, you know, the, the paradox about the disciples that I talked about before has now somehow become more acute. The disciples have been reduced to zero, but we're still listening in. So who are we? Um, um, but then um, at, towards the end of part three, so, Okay, so this is when he first went up the mountain. So when he first up the mountain, he has this conversation with solitude and solitude says, aha, now you have learned silence. And Zarathustra seems to agree. Now I've learned that it's vain to talk down there where people are listening, but up here I can talk, but that's silence. So um, uh, every, up here, everything wants to become words. Then um, there's in the, so, so that's at the point of part three where he's at the height of his happiness. He's so happy to get back to his cave. But then uh, in the middle of part three, there's this crisis where, um, Section is that. It says a lot of things before this happens. This whole part called uh, of old and new law tables, 
which is all reduced, is all addressed to someone. He keeps saying, oh, my brothers, oh, my brothers, this, oh, my brothers, that. But he's not, there's no one there. He's not talking to anyone. Um, but then finally we get to this chapter called The Convalescence. This is on, starts on page 232. After, so, I mean, it's after that long chapter I was talking about called Of Old and New Law Tables, where he's talking to his brothers, even though there's no one there. And it ends with, thus spoke Zarathustra. So this is another one of Zarathustra's discourses to his brothers who are no one, like his non-existent co-creators, I guess you'd say. Um, and then there's a uh, um, this chapter called the convalescent. And it says, starts one morning, not long after his return to the cave, Zaratus just sprang up from his bed like a madman, cried with a terrible voice, and behaved as if someone else were lying on the bed and would not rise from it. So, and then there's this whole, he's talking to his most abysmal thought. So he says, oh, most abysmal thought, get up from the bed, you, you know, you sluggard, it's time to get up. <laughs> um, I call you my most abysmal thought. Ah, you are coming, I hear you, my abyss speaks, I have turned my ultimate depth into the light. Ah, come here, give me your hand. And then all of a sudden he says, ha, huh, don't, ha ha, disgust, 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 woe is me, and he falls into a faint. <laughs> so he called his abysmal thought. I guess, you know, what he was doing there is like preparing for the victory that he says he's building himself up to at the end of, right, the, the end of the old and new law tablets begins with how, uh, ends with, sorry, the chapter called the Old and New Law Tablets ends with how he says, um, I'm readying myself for the great noontime. Um, oh, will, my essential, my necessity, dispeller of need, spare me for one great victory. And so I guess he thinks he's calling his most abysmal thought forth as part of this preparation for his one great victory at the great noontide. But when it actually comes, it overwhelms him. So, and as it seems like Zarathustra is, is genuinely unprepared for what this most abysmal thought is gonna be. He, like, he thinks he's prepared for it, but he really isn't. Um, and um, and only now does he understand the meaning of certain visions he had earlier. So I think both uh, the dream he had for, cl close to the end of part two where he's like a uh, um, guard in the, in the land of the dead and the door opens, and, or sorry, the, um, a wind blows down the door and a coffin comes in and opens up and this laughter comes out of the coffin. Um, and his disciple says, Zarathustra, this just foretells your victory. You're the one who's going to make laughter come out of the coffin and destroy your enemies and so forth. And Zarathustra looks at him afterwards and just like shakes his head. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so, I mean, he knew then that that was not the right interpretation of that dream, but apparently he didn't know what the right interpretation was. Um, and similarly, you know, the prophet who appears in part two and says, all's the same, you know, there's all weariness and whatever. Um, 
his disciples wanted to get rid of the prophet, and Zarathustra said, no, let's have a feast and he'll sit next to me. <laughs> um, but again, it seems like he didn't really understand what the prophet's vision meant. Um, and similarly, I guess, even the visions that he has on the ship at the beginning of part three, he didn't really understand what was going on. Um, um, especially in where he sees someone swap, a snake has crawled into someone's mouth and is choking them. Um, at the moment that he realizes what the abysmal thought is, or I mean, did he not know what the thought was before? Or did he just not think it hard enough before to be overcome by it? Like this, it's a little bit ambiguous, but there's something that he didn't realize until this moment. And at this moment, it overcomes him. And, um, and he lies there as if dead for seven days. His animals are worried about him and so forth. Um, and when he wakes up, so the abysmal thought has to do with the eternal recurrence. And I'll, I mean, I'll, yes, I'll, well, I mean, the abysmal thought is pretty much what I was hinting at the end last time, right? It's about the fact that the eternal current recurrence means that um, he can't only will his triumph. He has to will all the things he despises. And he has to will that they'll come again after his triumph. Um, so uh, he's stuck with them forever. They really are intransitory. That's the abysmal thought. Um, but uh, after he wakes up and starts to recover, his animals say, um, sing, speak no more, right? They tell him that what's good for him in his convalescence is not to speak, but to sing. Now, what kind of singing is this? Um, and does Zarathustra agree with the animals? Well, I guess, I mean, the answer to that, both of those questions is in the last chapter of Wrote down this on page 247, but it definitely is not. Oh, wait, maybe it is. Yeah, okay, right. The very last page of part three. Um, are not all words made for the heavy? Do not all words lie to the light? Speak, sing, speak no more. And that's Zarathustra talking to himself, not his animals talking to him. I mean, that distinction, right? I mean, his animals are his wisdom and his pride. So when his animals speak to him, he is kind of speaking to himself. Uh, although, again, there's more to his am animals than just symbols, because they actually bring him the food that he eats. Uh, I, mean, I don't know. Maybe that also can be understood symbolically. His his wisdom and his pride you know, were the ones who brought things around him that would sustain him when he woke up from the abysmal thought. <laughs> um, but so in any case, um, at, at, at the end, it's Zarathustra speaking directly. And he repeats the same thing the animals said. Sing, speak no more. But uh, what I, but what especially is worth emphasizing is that this time when he says it, it's preceded by this thing, do not all words, are not all words made for the heavy? Do not all words lie in the light? So this singing, I guess, is singing without words. Like bird song. 
right? It's not human song with words. Um, of course, I mean, he still is singing human song with words at the end of part three. But what he sings at the end of his song is sing, speak no more, where the song is, is without words. Um, so it appears that somewhere in between he, and it must have something to do with the abysmal thought, he learned to be silent in a deeper way than at the beginning. Right, you know, at first he learned to be silent, but being silent still meant talking and talking and talking. But later he learned to be silent, and being silent still doesn't mean making no noise, because it means singing, but it doesn't mean, but it means no talking anymore, no words. Um, that would have been a place that made sense to end the book, which is what Nietzsche, as I said before, originally intended. <laughs> um, since there's a part four, we realize that there's uh, more to say, I guess, right? I mean, but at least at the end of part three, it seems that like Zarathustra was done with everything he had to say. Um, I said, I'm a little scattered. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so I think this is the next thing to talk about first. So, like, I mean, I, I've, I've just raised a lot of questions, obviously, about what, you know, what's the difference between this part and this part? Where did he learn this and where did he learn that? I don't think I can answer all those questions, but I can say something more useful about it, I hope. So, um, and somehow it has to start with talking about the eternal recurrence. So, I mean, for one thing, why believe in this eternal recurrence? Where does that even come from? So there's, so to speak, a theoretical argument for eternal recurrence. And Nietzsche, in other works, makes the same argument seemingly with more seriousness than he does here. Why do I say with more seriousness? Because here, the argument is only made in a dream. And the argument is made in a dream when speaking to this dwarf. And the dwarf represents the spirit of gravity. So I, I think I actually can explain a little bit about what the spirit of gravity is, and I'm going to try to in a, in a moment. But in any case, you know, the spirit of gravity is Zarathustra's arch enemy. Um, um, he's been fighting with the spirit of gravity since the first, since that pole uh, dancer fell down. That, I think is the first time he mentions the spirit of gravity. So anyway, he's in, a, he's in a dream, and in a dream, he's talking to a dwarf, and the dwarf represents the spirit of gravity. And in that dream, he makes this argument. And the argument is that given an eternity, everything that can happen must eventually happen. And so if there's an eternity behind us and an eternity in front of us, um, whatever can happen must have already happened and must be going to happen again. <laughs> right? There's, there's room in both eternities for everything to happen. And, um, but, you know, but then if that's true, then there's room for, then, if everything is already happened and is going to happen again, then um, well, actually, there may be a, there's a lot of missing pieces in this argument. There may be another missing piece here. Um, how do we know it's not just twice? How do we know it has to happen over and over? 
So when he makes the argument in um, other books, it relies on the idea that the world is finite or something like that. And so there's only so many ways it can be rearranged. So uh, there's so so in other words, there's some long finite time in which everything that can happen will happen. Then you get eternal recurrence. He does in the argument of the dwarf, he doesn't really mention that. Okay. Um, and um, and assuming that the world is deterministic, as he does also assume when he's arguing with the dwarf, not only must everything happen again and again, but it must happen in the exact same sequence over and over, right? Because the world is deterministic, you know, whatever follows a certain event is necessarily what has to follow that event. So it is what will always follow that event every time it happens. So the world, you know, just repeats the same sequence eternally. Um, now, I mean, as I said, as I said, there's a lot of flaws in that argument. If you were to take it seriously as a kind of mathematical slash physical proof, um, I mean, uh, um, Or at least there are a lot of things that would have to be filled in. You'd have to say that not only are there uh, finitely many things in the world, but um, is even this enough? And I think even even given finitely many combinations and assuming that the future is determined by the past according to a certain law, it's still not true that things have to repeat themselves. Um, I mean, think about the digits of pi. So, uh, you know, there's only nine digits and they don't, there's no chance in their sequence. Um, has a certain law by which they succeed one another. And yet, I don't know if it can prove that they never repeat or just anyway, it can't prove that they repeat. No, you, no, you can definitely prove they never re repeat because if they repeated, pi would be a rational number, which it can't be. So, um, right. So, I mean, it's actually a, a finite world with finitely many possible combinations can um, proceed in an orderly way forever without repeating itself. Okay, so, you know, uh, um, I guess if you added still stronger presuppositions, you could, uh, yes, Ellen, did you have a question? Oh yeah, as long as this is a good time to, that's good. Sure. Okay, yeah, well, I'm just kind of wondering about that example with Pi. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get, you know, stuck here, of course, but um, I'm just thinking, like, could that more have to do with how we represent it? Because you can represent Pi in a finite way, like if you use the letter Pi. Um, and I mean, I, I don't really know exactly what I mean by this, but like in the same way that Pi is infinite, could we say that maybe other numbers might be infinite, just not in the way that we write them? Um, okay, let me think about that. I mean, so first of all, I was, I was actually was just talking about the decimal representation of pi, not pi the number, so to speak, right? I mean, the, pi the number, you might say, is the principle of that decimal representation. It's the law according to which it's generated um, by certain, by, um, or it's 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 this it's the source from which it's generated by certain rules. Um, 
So I was really just thinking about the sequence of decimal digits itself. Um, uh, I mean, I think that's all the question, the answer the question needs in this context. Uh, like, you know, I mean, you could still ask, I hear you as asking something like, is the difference between rational and irrational numbers just relative somehow? Um, I mean, yeah, that's not really a question for this course, uh, but right, right. I mean, it, I mean, it is obviously in the sense that um, um, the rational numbers, it is and it isn't in the following sense, I guess, that the real numbers remain the same, no matter what you choose as the unit. That is, you can you can switch from one unit to another, and you get the the same isomorphic structure of the real numbers again. So um, so you can so to speak pick the pi you know pi as the unit, and then you get real numbers where pi and its multiples are rational. And meanwhile, one what we call one and its units and its multiples are not rational. Um, but, um, but it really doesn't make any difference. It's still the same old real numbers. Um, that's my initial answer to that, but there's probably something better to say about it. Um, okay. Anyway, Nietzsche is not thinking about this and, um, I mean, couldn't be thinking about it exactly the way we are. In, uh, I mean, uh, all the concepts I was just using to talk about that are, are like post this time periods, right? So, um, but uh, I mean, he could be thinking about the digits of pi. Of course, they knew about that, you know. Um, uh, but he isn't, or I think, you know, I mean, you could make the argument work maybe by putting in stronger presuppositions, like about what kind of law has to, the world has to follow. Like it has to be only the one preceding state which determines the next state. Um, so if you say that, then I guess, if there's really only a finite number of possible combinations, which I mean, you know, so, so for that, there has to be not only a finite number of simple things in the world, so to speak, but also a finite space in which they move, or like a, a discrete space, right, with a finite number of positions. And, you know, so yeah, maybe you can make this argument work somehow, then the question is going to be then where do you get all those really strong presuppositions from them? <laughs> Right. So, I mean, uh, so as a theoretical argument, I think this is kind of like the way it's put here in a dream and whatever is kind of appropriate. It's not really convincing as a theoretical argument. Um, but presumably, even in the story with the dwarf, um, that's not really the motivation behind it either, right? I mean, Zarathustra is saying that to the dwarf in order to somehow get the dwarf off his back. Um, he's not saying it to the dwarf because he wants to enlighten the dwarf and teach the dwarf the truth about physics. Um, so, um, so in other words, like I guess I would say, or I think I'm tempted to put it this way, although I feel like I may be making another mistake by putting it this way, but I'm tempted to say, look, the proof is not theoretical, but practical. It's like Kant's moral proof of the existence of God. So like at the, you know, uh, what I said at the end last time about Nietzsche's atheism, one way you could summarize at least part of what I was saying is, that Nietzsche has a moral proof of the non-existence of God, right? If there were gods, how could I endure it? Therefore, there are no gods. Um, and where how can I endure it means how could I will? 
that is really the, the it, that really is that kind of exact inversion of Kant's moral proof of the existence of God. Kant's moral proof of the existence of God for, for those who aren't familiar with it is basically like, um, so Kant says there are no theoretical proofs of the existence of God that are valid. There are only three possible ways to go and I can show that none of them work. But he says, so, so that means that from the standpoint of theory, that is where I want to know what's true and what isn't, or as Schelling would put it, you know, like I want to leave the object unchanged and accommodate my representations to it. From that point of view, the answer to the question, does God exist, is, well, it turns out that the proofs are not, are not just invalid, but that they all make invalid use of concepts. Um, so that the answer isn't no, and it isn't even really, we don't know in the normal sense of we don't know. It's we don't know in the sense that this is a question that to which our faculties are not competent. We can't use concepts the way the question asks us to. That's the answer to the existence of God from a theoretical point of view, according to Kant. Whereas from the practical point of view, Kant says, well, um, from a practical point of view, I can know that something exists if it's necessary to represent it in order to answer the question, what should I do? For practical purposes, but here for practical, I mean, a lot of times when we say for practical purposes, we just, we just mean like, that's an okay assumption if you don't look at it too, too hard, you know, you can use it as a heuristic or something like that. But here, practic for practical purposes means something really strict, right? Like practice is, is impossible if I don't represent to myself something as existing. And, you know, and what, I, the, what leads to the existence of God is exactly what I was saying before, that we need an executive in the kingdom of ends to make a long story maybe somewhat shorter than I should because it's a little more complicated than that. But in any case, so, uh, so uh, you know, Nietzsche is saying the same thing about the non-existence of God. I can't um, try to will something unless I um, believe that I can enforce it or something I can create can enforce it. And I can't create God, so that would so, so the existence of God is like contradicts my, contradicts the possibility of my will. So from a practical standpoint, I can't stand it. Um, so I can't I can't represent it, so to speak. Um, um, and so what I want to say is that the eternal recurrence is somehow also like that for Nietzsche. Why would the occurrence, eternal recurrence also be like that? Well, this again is, you know, um, what he starts to address near the end of part two. And I think I just referred to this briefly last time, but I couldn't really read it inside. Um, Um, so it's in the chapter called Of Redemption. On page 161, he starts off, he says, willing liberates. So that was the teaching from the beginning of part two. But what is it that fastens and fetters even the liberator? It was. That is what the will's teeth gnashing and most lonely affliction is called. Powers, powerless against that which has been done. The will is an angry, angry spectator of all things past. The will cannot will backwards. That it cannot break time and time's desire. That is the will's most lonely affliction. So how can that be? This makes it seem like even after all this stuff about the will being a liberator because I can will to create the Superman and so forth, and back in the same situation I was. Willing is impossible. Um,
And on page 163, the answer to that is, Um, all it was is a fragment, a riddle, a dreadful chance until the creative will says to it, but I willed it thus. Until the creative will said to it, but thus, but I will it thus, thus shall I will it. Skipping a little bit, the will that is the will to power must will something higher than any reconciliation. But so, so it's higher than any reconciliation because it's not enough for it to be reconciled to what to, to it was being the way it was. It's saying, okay, that's all right with me. It has to will it. Who has taught it to will backwards too? And then he says, then it says, but at this point of his discourse, Zarathustra suddenly broke off and looked exactly like a man seized by extremist terror. But after a short time, he laughed again and said in a soothed voice, it is difficult to live among men because keeping silent is so difficult, especially for a babbler. Right. So right, that, that is, that's the point at which it occurred to him, I think, that only the eternal recurrence could solve this problem. And at first, he shows his disciples the signs of terror. But then he realizes he can't talk to them about it. And so the first thing he says is, it is, you know, uh, it is difficult to live among men because keeping silent is so difficult, especially for a babbler, right? That's because he just realized he's not going to say it. But he just realized that he, although he can't say it to his disciples, he has to believe it because that's the condition of possibility of the will to power. Yes, Barnabas. So I am not clear on this. So why is it necessary that I have to will backwards as well? Um, Because, uh, well, okay, maybe that's a good question. Maybe I don't understand as well as I should. Um, But I mean, okay, so assuming there's no eternal recurrence, I mean, why am I resisting this? There's a simple way of answering that, right? I mean, there's an easy way of answering that, and it's related to the, the same questions Kant is asking about freedom of the will. How is it consistent with the fact that my will was determined by what happened before me? Um, so, uh, I mean, it'd be pretty easy to understand from that point of view. I, as I said, I don't know why I'm resisting. I feel like that's too simple in this context in Nietzsche. But it's something like that anyway, right? So the it's like, what? Yeah. So it's like, if I don't, if I cannot explain that I will and everything that happened before, then I would kind of reduce the whole question to God being necessary for my existence. Well, it's not so much God. No, I mean, it's just like whatever happened before you is makes your existence necessary and makes whatever you do necessary. So freedom. Right. So you're not in freedom free. somehow. Yeah. So you don't. Um, and remember this, we're, we're talking about the will being a liberator, right? So like the will being an active faculty that um, doesn't obey anyone else, but obeys itself. 
So, I mean, in Kant, you know, uh, that paradox is, is resolved by, by means of what Nietzsche would call a back world, I think. Right? In Kant, that paradox is resolved by saying that from a practical standpoint, I don't regard the um, world as closed and deterministic. I regard it as having you know, self-determining causes outside itself. Um, um, so, well, actually, I mean, I'm not 100% sure that's fair to Kant, to, to, that, that really is an example of what Nietzsche is calling a back world or not. Nietzsche also doesn't claim to be being fair to Kant or anyone else. <laughs> so, you know, um, but 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 at least I mean that's the reading at Kant, of Kant that I think that Nietzsche has in mind uh, when he. I mean, it's one of the things he has in mind when he talks about the backworlders. Also, his own view in *Birth of Tragedy*, um, but. Um, maybe even Emerson. I'm not sure, but in any case, so here, like. Um, um, we don't want to solve it that way. That way means um, maligning the world. Uh, um, and therefore, uh, undermining life, not serving life. It means preferring something that is above time and not self-overcoming, right? Like a Kantian noumenal will, this is one of the problems he faces in the religion book. It can't change. It's, he has a lot of trouble. I mean, he actually, in the end, he does something interesting with it, but, he, but it's, he has trouble explaining how like repentance is possible. Um, so, uh, um, but it, it certainly doesn't overcome itself. Overcoming yourself is something that happens in time. Great. So, I mean, so, so Nietzsche doesn't want that kind of back world solution, but he does still have the problem, let's say. How can you call this the will to power or self overcoming or whatever if it was all determined before you? Is, is that, how, I, I mean, again, I keep feeling like that's not sufficient, but is that at least helpful? That's what he's thinking. Yeah. You, you can think of it in that relatively simple way, at least, right? And so, and so then, you know, if you think of it that way, so how can freedom be reconciled with determinism? Um, if freedom would require willing not only whatever is to come, but also what came before. And the answer is, well, if what came before is also in the future, <laughs> you can will it. Um, so, um, So it's terrifying. I mean, again, something has to be said about this and I'm not sure, I mean, it's a question, but it's not a question I'm sure I can answer. What, what's the difference or is there a difference between that terror that Zarathustra um, shows the first time he thinks of the eternal recurrence and the more than terror, like almost death that he experiences back up in his cave when he arouses his most, most abysmal thought. Um, I guess one way of understanding would be that he, uh, that he actually, but this that doesn't seem consistent with realizing he has to keep silent about it. I was going to say one way to understand it would be to say 
that he he really does soothe himself the first time falsely. Right, he manages not to focus on the abysmal thought, and that's how he becomes cheerful again. But um, but like I said, I feel that's not right because that terror like continues to motivate him to leave his disciples and go up the mountain and all that stuff. So so it remains to say that. He finds it terrible, but he doesn't quite realize how terrible it is. Um, I mean, yeah, but I'm not sure how to fill that in exactly. I mean, I know how to explain it's terrible using the most abysmal thought. What is the abys most abysmal thought? Um, it's summarized on page 236. Alas, man recurs eternally. The little man recurs eternally. And uh, he almost has relapses when he says that. This is when he's a convalescent. Actually, this is when they say, speak no further. Huh. The greatest all too small, that was my disgusted man. An eternal recurrence, even for the smallest, that was my disgusted all existence. Ah, disgust, disgust, disgust. Thus spoke Zarathustra and sighed and shuddered, for he remembered his sickness, but his animals would not let him speak further. Speak no further, convalescent, thus his answer, animals answered him. Oh yeah, and sure enough, see? The next thing they say, they say, speak no further, but go out to where the world awaits you like a garden. Go out to the roses and bees and flocks of doves, but go out especially to the songbirds so that you may learn singing from them. So even then, he's, uh, even there they're telling him, when they tell him to stop speaking and sing, although reading it, you may not notice this, they're telling him to sing without words, trying to learn to sing from the songbirds. Um, right, so, but anyway, so, so that what set that all off, the most abysmal thought is that the thing that most disgusts him, that he has to will to recur eternally. Now, how does Zarathustra overcome that most abysmal thought? Um, and somehow the key to it, and this is also why we're talking about songbirds, the key to it is lightness, flying up, flying up instead of climbing up a mountain and flying up into an innocent, empty sky. Right? Remember, the sky at the beginning of the book is the sky with the sun in it. But the sky he appeals to towards the end of part three is the sky before sunrise, a cloudless sky before sunrise. Rise. There's nothing in it at all. That's what he wants to fly up into. Um, and that's the very end of part three. The last thing he says is, um,
Oh, well, no, I mean, it's the beginning of the se section seven of the, the last chapter, the seventh of the, se the seventh of the seven seals begins. If ever I spread out a still sky above myself and flew with my own wings into my own sky, if playing I have swum into deep light distances and bird wisdom came to my freedom, but thus speaks bird wisdom, behold, there is no above, no below. Fling yourself out, back, weightless bird. Sing, speak no more. Are not all words made for the heavy? Do not all words lie to the light? Sing, speak no more. And then there's the refrain. Oh, how should I not lust for eternity and for the wedding ring of, of rings, the ring of recurrence? For I love you, O oh eternity. So, um, so lightness, lightness to the point, so it's not climbing a mountain. It's also not flying in a laborious sense. It's being so light that there is no up or down for you, that you're swimming in the midst of this empty sky. Um, um, that somehow represents the way he escapes from the most abysmal thought. And that somehow is why his enemy, or this reveals to him, I guess, what it means that his enemy all along was the spirit of gravity. Um, So how to explain that metaphor? Um, so one of the things the dwarf says to him, this is on page 177 of the vision and the riddle. Oh, Zarathustra, he said mockingly, syllable by syllable, you stone of wisdom, you have thrown yourself high, but every stone that is thrown must fall. So what does the spirit of gravity mean when they say that? Well, I think it means, maybe here's a, a kind where I actually could use the whiteboard, although it seems ridiculous to use it once in the whole lecture, but let's see if it even works. Works. that you know um so self overcoming what the disciples think and what he maybe even thinks at the beginning of part two is that self overcoming works like this like you know i get above myself to the superman and then i get above that and then i get above that Um, but we've learned that self-overcoming, that is, Zarathustra has learned that self-overcoming won't do what he wants it to do, show how his will can be free, unless there's eternal recurrence. And eternal recurrence means that in willing self-overcoming, he has to will this. So no matter how high this gets, and I think that's what the dwarf is saying, somewhere before we get back here, it has to fall again. Right? It has to fall back to this level again so we can get around to here. So, um, that's like the symbolic importance of gravity at this point. Now, I mean, else, gravity also means other things. I mean, for one thing, it's, you know, it means seriousness as opposed to laughter. Um, and I, a lot of times when he's talking about the spirit of gravity, he seems to have that in mind. But, but at least at that one point in the vision, it, I want to say it becomes clear what was going on all along, that gravity 
really meant um, that inexorable force of the eternal recurrence that no matter what I do in the way of self overcoming is sure to drag me back down. Um, Um, so how does Zarathustra overcome that? It's not by denying that, that, that that's the case. Um, it's somehow by denying that that's, um, problem. And, um, you know, I think it comes out in the, in the conversation with the dwarf that, I mean, um, when, when Zarathustra uh, first tries to teach the dwarf about the eternal recurrence. Um, he says, but if one were to, so he says there's two root roads, one leading forward and one leading backward, and they meet at this gate and they all go, they both go infinitely far. And he says, but, one or, but if one were to follow them further and even further and further, do you think, dwarf, that these paths would be an eternal opposition? Everything straight lies, murmured the dwarf disdainfully. All truth is crooked. Time itself is a circle. But Zarathustra doesn't, so it's, it's like, you might think at that point, the dwarf is explaining that he agrees with Zarathustra, but he already knows that. Time itself is a circle, but it seems like Dar Zarathustra from his response thinks that's the wrong answer. And why is it the wrong answer? Because it, they're straight, the paths are straight. <laughs> it's not a circle. It's not true that everything straight lies. Um, the mistake is, or it's not a mistake, but the thing that has to be overcome in the abysmal thought is um, And it's somehow the same thing that the bird is trying to teach him about there is neither, neither up nor down when you get high enough into the sky. <laughs> um, that uh, um, I think maybe you should put it this way that it's, you know, um, If you stop the story here, oops, you can't see it now. If you stop the story here, that's your fault. It really goes on and when it goes on, it goes back up. <laughs> Um, so that if, like, if you really understand that, um, and it, it, time is not a circle, you're not literally going to get back to where you were before. Just the same thing is going to happen again. The same thing is going to happen again, but you will it. Why do you will it? Because it's the condition of your victory. It was the condition of your victory this time, and it's the condition of your victory this time. It will always be the condition of your victory, eternally. 
something like that is the way Zarathustra gets through this, I think. But again, I feel like there's things that I'm not understanding here. Like there's more to it than that. Um, but and that's but in any case, something like that is why he ends by saying that thing about there's neither up nor down. And why the speaking is without words or the singing is without words. Not sure I know how to tie that in, but it must be really important. Well, there's another piece of evidence that there's something important here I don't understand. But in any case, that's why he ends with that part and then says, for I love you, O eternity. Right? The way to the, the way to overcoming goes through being powerful enough to take this most abysmal thought and say, Yes, I will that too. Because it's the condition of my of my willing. Um, um, all right. Well, I feel like that would be a pretty unsatisfactory way to end. There were a few more things I wanted to say about. Um, it may be too complicated to say. Like looping back to Schelling and Coleridge and trying to, to explain exactly in what sense the eternal recurrence, and especially in the form it turns up at the very end of part three, like. Yeah, maybe, uh, well, I have zero time left, so I can't develop this, but it's occurring to me that. Maybe I do understand a little bit more than I thought. I mean, here's the thing. So, like, remember that in a limited time, it's probably easiest to explain this by reference to Coleridge or limited or negative time. It's probably easier to explain this by reference to Coleridge. Um, remember how in Coleridge, the effect of grace is that um, the moral law is reabsorbed into the will. So it's no longer a law that stands against me. So the eternal recurrence the way he overcomes it, and this is somehow what the height and the no longer speaking, um, the no longer being the rational animal or the, the animal that speaks its commands to itself, that, that the way of overcoming the most abysmal thought is to, um, Sorry, all you can see is this picture, right? <laughs> and back one last time. But the way for overcoming the most abysmal thought is that you have to will the law by which the eternal recurrence occurs. It has to become your law. This is Nietzsche's version of that. And that's why this is Nietzsche's version of redemption through grace. Okay, that's a little bit less satisfactory as a way to end the entire course. Not very satisfactory still, but uh, we are out of time, so we're gonna have to stop. And uh, yeah, so thank you all, and especially those who have kept attending one way or the other. Um, uh, and um, not planning to hold regular office hours next week, but if you want to talk to me between now and when the paper is due, let me know and we can set something up. Um, or obviously you can email me with any questions or anything like that. And um, other than that, I guess have a good break. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question. Oh yeah have a few minutes sure why not just like um so i it's a question about 
wide or like what assumption is that that the word has to be deterministic in the argument for eternal recurrence because when he's like trying to like free himself why does he need to fall back on or like why does he assume that the word is deterministic um yeah that's a good question um but i think the answer actually is so you know in in kant um like the way kant resolves this um uh conflict between free will and determinism is very finely balanced because um in order for willing to make sense on the one hand um the law of cause and effect has to be uh absolute right because uh, like um if things happen in the world just by chance then there's no way my decision what to do can um have any relationship to what's actually going to happen right so determinism is actually necessary for free will at least in a certain way of understanding free will so and, right and that's why kant has to resolve it the way he does which, which is by saying that from a theoretical standpoint um, um we can show that in the world that we can know for theoretical purposes there can no be no exceptions to the law of cause and effect um and we only know ourselves um as bodies in that world so we're part of that but then he has to explain why you know at the same time we have to we have to recognize that there's a limit to our the competence of our theoretical faculties beyond which there are questions that can be asked but not answered from a theoretical point of view and so he can go to a different point of view and say there you know there's there's an uncaused cause okay so i mean all of that is playing from Kant's point of view but i think but i hope it's pretty clear why like from for nietzsche there's the same type of issue i think yeah he doesn't have a theoretical proof maybe the way kant thinks he does that the world is deterministic i mean maybe in some places he says he does but in other places um um sometimes actually he sounds like he's saying that um physical necessity actually is is can be derived from the will to power not the other way around right so um yeah so i, I think you can say that he doesn't have a theoretical proof of it but he does have a practical proof of it it's necessary to the will to power. It's there. That is, it's necessary to willing anything that I represent the world as deterministic. Thanks. Okay. All right. So thank you once again. That's the time I will really leave. Bye. Bye. <laughs>